Hi there, and welcome to our final session of A Life Worth Living. Throughout the past nine sessions, we have been exploring the secret of Paul's contentment in Christ and the newness that a relationship with Jesus brings to our lives and makes it worth living. In our previous session, we looked at how Jesus gives us new resources. In this session, we'll see how Jesus Christ gives us a new generosity. As we start, let's pause for a moment in our groups to read the Bible passage we'll be looking at in this session. One of you can pray and then someone else can read Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 23. We can sometimes feel pressure to give money to lots of different things. We can often be bombarded by different requests to donate to crowdfunding, sponsored marathons and fundraising campaigns only to get to church and be asked to give even more money there. What should our attitude to generosity be and why is it important? In this passage, Paul writes to thank this group of Christians at Philippi who have sent him money via Epaphroditus and outlines three blessings of generosity, giving us an insight into the secret of his contentment. Paul thanks the Philippians for making him so happy. In verse 10, he writes, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. In the next verses, he reveals his attitude to money. On the one hand, he writes that in some ways he does not need the money. In verse 11, he says, I am not saying this because I am in need. Why has he no need? Because he has learned something very important. In Romans 7, he tells the Christians in Rome that before he was a Christian, he used to be envious of others. Now he has learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. What is the secret of contentment? Many think that the secret is to have everything they want. They say to themselves, if only I had a better house, a, a bigger car, more money, then I would be content. Others think the secret lies in human relationships or in looking perfect. The singer George Michael achieved all of this, but it did not bring contentment, as he explained in his song, Freedom. Speaking about the facade of celebrity, he had, quote, brand new clothes and a big fat place, but he concluded, sometimes the clothes do not make the man. These things do not bring contentment, only a desire for more of the same. John D. Rockefeller, who founded the Standard Oil Company and made hundreds of millions of dollars, was once asked, how much money does it take to make a man happy? He answered, just a little bit more than he has. Paul has learned to be content in any and every situation. He is not saying there is anything wrong with having food and possessions, but these should not be the primary source of our contentment, nor should they become gods. For Paul, the secret of real contentment is the transforming friendship of Jesus Christ. He writes in verse 13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He has learned to live not on his outer resources, but on his inner resources. The person who has learned this secret is truly rich. Paul was rich because in Christ, he had found the secret of contentment. For this reason, he was able to write to the Philippians that in some ways he did not need their money. However, in some ways he did need the money. He writes in verses 14 to 16, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Paul had had troubles and had been in need. The Philippians had shared in his troubles and had sent him money again and again. The word used for share is a word which derives from the Greek word koinoia, which means fellowship. 
communion or close relationship. Sharing is a vital part of life with those we have a close relationship with. In the church, we give to bless the church as a whole and also to bless the individual. This kind of sharing supports the work of the church whilst also providing for specific needs. As we share in the blessing of giving, we also share in the blessing of receiving. Paul does not want the Philippians to think that he is asking them for money. He is more concerned that they should be blessed too. All through this passage, Paul uses technical banking and accounting terms. In verse 15, he speaks of credit and debit, giving and receiving, the two sides of an accountant's ledger. In verse 17, he writes about profit and interest. The word for credited is a word used in banking for financial growth. Finally, in verse 18, when he says, I have received full payment, he uses a commercial term, meaning to receive a sum in full and give a receipt for it. Putting it into commercial terms, Paul explains that giving is an investment of capital. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, he uses the picture of a farmer sowing seed. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Giving is planting seed. A farmer who sows is investing for the future for he knows that he will reap far more than he has sown. Hattie Mae Wyatt, a six-year-old girl, lived near Grace Baptist Church in Philadelphia, USA. The Sunday school was very crowded. Russell H. Conwell, the minister, told her that one day, they would have buildings big enough to allow everyone to attend. She said, I hope you will. It's so crowded, I'm afraid to go there alone. He replied, when we get the money, we will construct one large enough to get all the children in. Two years later, in 1886, Hattie Mae died. After the funeral, Hattie's mother gave the minister a little bag they'd found under their daughter's pillow, containing 57 cents in change that she had saved up. Alongside it was a note in her handwriting to help build bigger so that more children can go to Sunday school. The minister changed all the money into pennies and offered each one for sale. He received $250 and 54 of the cents were given back. The $250 was itself changed into pennies and sold by the newly formed Wyatt Might Society. In this way, her 57 cents kept on multiplying. 26 years later, in a talk entitled, The History of the 57 Cents, the minister explained the results of her 57 cent donation. A church with a membership of over 5,600 people, a hospital where tens of thousands of people had been treated, 80,000 young people going through university, 2,000 people going out to preach the gospel. All this happened because Hattie Mae Wyatt invested her 57 cents. The theme of multiplication runs throughout the Bible. What cannot be achieved by addition, God does by multiplication. You reap what you sow, only many times more. God is able to do a lot with a small amount. What you give to the Lord, He multiplies. This spiritual principle applies to everything in life. Whatever we give to the Lord, he multiplies, whether it is our home, our time, our gifts, ambitions, or money. The return on our investment is not necessarily financial, rather we are investing in people. We see lives changed, people coming into the kingdom of God, the hungry being fed, the naked clothed, drug addicts set free, marriages restored, and the sick healed. 
Every time we hear a report back from a work in which we have invested, we are reaping the reward for our investment. For the most part, we will have to wait until heaven to see the full impact of our investment. But we do get occasional glimpses of it here and now as a foretaste. The New Testament principle is that if we want treasure in heaven, we have to send it on in advance. What will be the reward in heaven? I don't know, but I suspect we will see the faces of those who have, we have unknowingly helped. We will hear them say, I became a Christian partly as a result of your gift, or my marriage was restored, or I was healed. Not only will we see their faces, but we will see the face of Jesus. We get a foretaste of this now, which is why in giving generously, it is not only the recipients who are blessed, we are also blessed. Let's take some time to pause for discussion in our groups. What does generosity mean to you? And what do you think about the idea of making an eternal investment? Paul turns from the commercial world of banking to the language of the temple in verse 18. He writes that such a mundane matter as material gifts is first of all a fragrant offering. This language is borrowed from the Old Testament and means literally the fragrance of a sweet smell. It is the expression used in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 for Christ's offering of himself for us on the cross. It speaks of something very beautiful, an act of great love. Second, generous giving is an acceptable sacrifice. We cannot earn our salvation. The sacrifice of Jesus was a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice. We cannot add to something which is already full, perfect and sufficient. Our sacrifice is one of thanksgiving and praise, and part of that should be a generosity in our giving. It may be a sacrifice, and sacrifices are not always easy. There is a cost. It is hard to give. It goes against the grain. Yet it is an act which, more than anything else, liberates us from the hold money might otherwise have on our lives. Third, Paul says that generous giving is pleasing to God. It is an extraordinary and wonderful statement of the New Testament generally, and in particular of Paul in this passage, that what we do here can please God. If we give generously to his children, God is pleased. Throughout the New Testament, we are encouraged to give generously. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says our giving should be regular and proportionate to our income. Many Christians believe it is right to give a tenth of their income on the basis of Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. These may be guidelines, but generosity is the only rule in the New Testament. As we give generously, Paul says in verse 19, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. It is very personal. Paul speaks of my God. He can trust him because he has a close, personal, intimate relationship with God. God will meet all your needs. The word means fill up by adding. Many Christians who give, for example, 10% of their income have found that the 90% left more than covers what the 100% did before they started giving. God promises to meet all your needs. This must include our material needs, though not necessarily our material wants. Our needs will be met according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, not merely from his wealth, but in a manner that matches his wealth. We cannot outgive God. Rick Warren, pastor and co-founder of Saddleback Church, tells this story about giving. Kay and I became reverse tithers. When we got married 30 years ago, we began tithing 10%. Each year we would raise our tithe 1% to stretch our faith. 11% the first year, 12% the second year, 13% the third year. Every time I give, it breaks the grip of materialism in my life. Every time I give, it makes me more like Jesus. Every time I give, my heart grows bigger. And so now we give away 90% and we live on 10%. That was actually the easiest part, what to do with the money. Just give it away because I'm storing up treasures in heaven. 
Our generosity stems from God's generosity to us. It is no coincidence that the letter to the Philippians begins and ends with grace. For at the heart of this letter, we see God's grace expounded. Grace is one of the most important words in the New Testament. It summarizes the essence of Christianity. It includes all the riches of God's undeserved love for us made possible through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The central theme of this letter is the central theme of the New Testament and the Bible as a whole, God's love and generosity. God's love and generosity are seen throughout the Bible and supremely in the cross of Christ. In Matthew 22 verses 37 to 40, Jesus taught that our highest duty is to love God with all our hearts, souls and minds. After that, our duty is to love our neighbour as ourselves. In the last four verses of Philippians, we see examples of such love, which also summarises so much of the teaching in this book. First, he expresses his love for God. Paul loves the one who is both his God and his father and theirs. His overriding desire is to see God's name glorified. He ends this section with a tribute of praise. Second, he expresses his love for others. In the final verses, Paul sends his greetings to each one of God's people. He wants to make sure that they all hear that Paul sends his love to them. And he points out in verse 22 that it is not only him, but all the saints send you greetings. He sends special greetings from the Christian brothers who belong to Caesar's household, the government administration in Rome, a kind of imperial civil service. Christianity had already penetrated the highest positions in the empire. As one commentator puts it, the crucified Galilean carpenter had already begun to rule those who ruled the greatest empire in the world. Third, Paul ends as he began with God's undeserved love for us. Jesus is the channel of all good gifts which comes to us. In verse 23, Paul prays for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be with them. It is his love for us which enables us to love him and to love others. He is the source of our love. Let's break into groups now and take some time to discuss the following question. How easy do you find it to trust that God will meet all your needs? Are there any areas in your life where you can begin practicing greater generosity? Thanks so much for joining us for this series of A Life Worth Living. We hope you and your group have enjoyed studying Paul's letter to the Philippians together and exploring how to live a life of purpose, passion and joy. We love to pray for you as we close. Lord Jesus, thank you that life with you really is a life worth living. We pray that you would fill us afresh, full of your Holy Spirit, to live and work for you in everything we do. Amen.